welcome to my show and uh, delighted to be here. Thank you to be here uh, and giving us your time to to talk about yourself a bit and uh, understanding the the journey for you to be who you are today as an entrepreneur. So, can you please start maybe ask um, just introducing yourself with yeah. your name and what your current business is about? Yeah. Okay. Great. It's, uh, my name is Tom Cassidy. Um, my Current business, I suppose, is a. I'm. I would say I'm an educational entrepreneur. So I'm an entrepreneur within the field of education. I'm the yeah. principal of Cambridge Leadership College, which yeah. is how we met because that's yes. on the same site here. Yes. Um, which is a sixth form college for people who uh, sixth form in the UK is like sixteen to nineteen, so yes. pre university, and the idea is that they run real businesses alongside doing their academic subjects. Um, uh, we've just. Um, won a contract to set up 10 schools in China, which is similar, uh, but not exactly the same because they're not as interested in the entrepreneurship. Um, they're more interested in getting their kids into the best UK universities. Um, and I've got a, my third strand, I suppose, is um, online programs. And I've got about 120, 130,000 students worldwide on my online programs, most of which are on the Udemy platform, oh, which is for online learning. Yeah, so that's yes, kind yes. of broadly the business. Right. Fantastic. So, how long have you been in this uh, um, this sector of entrepreneurship, so the educational entrepreneurship? Um, well, I I thought I'd go into education because I thought it'd be a really good way to travel the world. So mm. I thought if I got it, I did a physics degree from Oxford, and I thought mm. if I get if I have a physics degree from Oxford and I have a, a teaching qualification from the UK, I can travel around the world. Um, so that's why I went into education in the first place. And um, I went to Hong Kong fairly early on. In, two th in 1999, I went to Hong Kong. And it was then when I first got into the entrepreneurial side of things because I noticed a gap. It's really, really simple. I noticed that the, the, the Chinese, the Hong Kong Chinese were really, really good at um, diligence and discipline. And they were mm. very good at engineers that'd be perfect, very yes. good at rule following, brilliant. But, but something to do with the face-saving aspect of the culture. They didn't like to be wrong. Yes. And being an entrepreneur, the number one thing you're going to be is wrong. You're going to, you're going to be wrong a lot, right? <laughs> and, and accepted. And my way of explaining it is you're just hoping to be increasingly less wrong as you go along, right? Yes. As, as you learn. And so I thought, well, there's... Make a smaller mistakes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I thought, oh, there's a gap here. Maybe I could teach yes. um, some of the Western principles of being wrong and fill a gap and so I started a school there in in Hong Kong teaching entrepreneurship to MBA students in in China two Chinese universities in wow. in Hong Kong and that was why I started got a got a taste for it and I set up my own school there in Hong Kong so I suppose from about 99 so about the last sort of 20 years I've been mm -hmm. doing the entrepreneurial thing but the first few years I was just regular teaching and I thought I didn't go into teaching because I wanted to be a teacher. Mm. I wanted to go into teaching because I thought traveling. Was traveling around the world and also a nice intersection of kind of entrepreneurship as well. And you were teaching English? Or? I was teaching physics. Oh, physics. So okay. I, I taught for taught in um, a secondary school. Yeah, private school in the UK before I went out. So I graduated in 1990, something like that. And then taught for a few years in, in private schools in the UK and a little bit. So I thought I got the qualifications, right? So yeah. I could do teaching. And the great thing about the, 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 the international schools all over the world, if you want to, you could teach, you know, because because it's more or less the same curriculum, like yeah. the IB curriculum or even yes. the A-levels. Yes. You yes. can travel around the whole world and yes. you don't even have to learn anything new, yeah, which yeah, is quite yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yes. Okay, so... You already partially explained, but the question is more like explain how your past experience led to your current activity. Yeah. So, okay, so my dad said to me, he said, um, if you really know what to do in life, do that. If you don't know what to do, do physics. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the thinking behind that is because that leaves so many doors open yes. to you because you. It's a very yeah. broad, sci highly scientific. It's uh, all about I know the, physicists who can do right. all sorts of things. Logic and it's problem solving. Yes. It's approaching There's things. Also absolutely. So 
And what I like most about the physics, I didn't like the math side of it that much. And you know what I didn't like? I didn't like the practical side of it. I didn't like doing physics experiments either. Yeah. But what I did like was the problem solving. So yes. it's very logical to go from problem solving in physics to problem solving in real life. Yes. And most of the problem solving in real life relate to kind of business or mm. opportunities. So I was, was always looking at how things could be done better. Always think, oh, how would you do this? Oh, this is interesting. Oh, a lot of people, um, you know, on the roads all at the same time you know in the morning this is very interesting you know I was already thinking about you know self-driving cars and all sorts of stuff yes. from, a, from a long way back so problem solving as a discipline from physics got me into education as the area where I thought I could probably have the most impact for entrepreneur because I thought we could do things differently and yeah. my dad was also very much an entrepreneur right. he had lots of different businesses and he um I think that what, what he he was just a really really nice guy who loved mm. talking to people. He's a bit like you, Massimo. He loved talking <laughs> to everybody, I do. and he yes. encouraged me to ask lots of questions. Yes, and I thought you know, people are great. If I could go around solving problems for people and sort of coming up with businesses that solve problems for yes. people, I think that'd be something. It'll be fun. So more or less, what I've always tried to do, I've always tried to say, so how can I do th these things better? And wh why is education interesting to me? Because um, I think I could. I like young people as well, yeah, because they're not too close in their thinking, mm. and also I think that if you can inspire young people to think differently, yes, then the world's going to change much faster. Yeah. So I, I see education as like a distribution channel for good ideas, and so that's kind of yeah, very yeah, very, very nice definition. I like that very much. Yes. So now going back to your current business so yep. the Cambridge Leadership College yeah so um, the defeat the, the decision to open this mm. new very innovative yeah. I mean when I read the specification when you first arrived here so oh, wow that's amazing <laughs> you know that someone thought about yeah. implementing a yeah. you know a sixth form college based on entrepreneurship is absolutely yeah. revolutionary from my point of view so I was really really pleased to read that so was it a gradual uh, kind of decision that one thing led to the other or one day maybe I don't know you saw a gap in the market and you said I'm gonna do that I can do that kind of thing yeah good question actually no I mean I started it first of all really in Hong Kong the yeah. idea which was that based on the fact that it wasn't in the Chinese curriculum at all I thought well we could teach it and then I sort of realized that it actually wasn't in any curriculum around no. the world you know and so this was the, the concept of the, the entrepreneurship school or business school as well for, for young people is, well, okay, if you want to learn to be a hairdresser, you don't do it by reading books. You do it by cutting hair. Yes. If you want to be an architect, you, okay, you might do lots of designs, but you've actually got to do some buildings, right? You can't, you can't learn that theoretically. Yeah. But it seemed to me that everyone's trying to teach business by it just being theoretical or best case you might do some case studies yeah. or something like that you know or, or maybe some limited projects but it's not real and it, I, I my concept was it's a bit like if I'm playing if I'm gambling with fake money like I'm playing Monopoly it doesn't yeah. mean anything no but if I'm gambling with real money or, if, or yeah I've got some skin in the game and it changes things completely yeah. so what we did is in Hong Kong the original concept started off with just summer schools and then it moved to like these um, uh, entrepreneurship electives in the MBA programs we started with young kids 15, 16 we'd actually give them money we'd give them a whole bunch of money and say what you can do is you've got a hundred hours from Monday morning to Friday after, Friday evening Here's 100,000 Hong Kong dollars, which was about 8,000 pounds, something like oh. that. So not insignificant amounts of money. No. Actual money in a briefcase. Yes. Cash. Any profit you make on this money, by the end of the week, you can keep. You just have to give us back the money. Wow. And, and not just to let them go and just leave them to their own devices, but actually systematically work with them to turn any crazy ideas they might have into a sort of a business model that might work. And in a short period of time, you're looking at event-based things. But then they're, they're, they've got this, 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 oh, you know, if people actually give us money and teach us how to turn ideas into business models and then teach us how to build prototypes, then we can learn, we can do stuff. And so then, then I had the difficult part, which was, this was received really well in Hong Kong, which was really, really going quite nicely. For personal reasons, mm. I came back 
to the UK. And then from 2005 to 2015, I basically fought the establishment in the UK, trying to bring in this thing which had already worked in Hong Kong into the state sector. And in 2014, 2015, I thought, it ain't going to happen. I'm just going to have to do it myself. You have to do it and demonstrate it works. And eventually somebody will notice it. And and the problem with that is you're limiting it. Because I wanted to do it in the state sector because the state sector means that everyone can have access to it. Yes. Um, and the number of ventures got quite a long way. Quite, you know, I've got we interesting. We even got approval from exam boards like Edexcel to run this instead of an A level program. Wow. You run the BTEC program. Students run real businesses. Instead of doing all the um, typical assessments, they do video based Viva assessments where we're interviewing them about the particular their own business yes. and how them talking about what they did in their own business demonstrates the competencies that are required for the BTEC. The exam boards were happy. Yeah. But you know who wasn't happy? It's that the people who were running the state schools were saying, oh, well, we don't, we wouldn't want to jeopardise, you know. So so there's no risk takers in the state sector in education, right? Of course not. Uh, but the problem is, is like, is, is, as it happens all the time, you mentioned before the fact that, you know, people teach uh, business and the majority of people teaching business in business schools never run a business in their life. Yeah. They never run a business. Many of them never run a business. Some of them, you know, if you go to Judge Business School in Cambridge, there are a few people that are, or are entrepreneurs. Yeah. They yeah. have the entrepreneur in house, in uh, and they are they are entrepreneur mm. like serious mm-hmm. entrepreneurs with yeah. with really good track record. But many of the teachers, you know, they come out from an MBA themselves. They have yeah. a, an economics degree, and then they yeah. go and teach economics yeah. models applied yeah. to business. And nobody uses much of that stuff because it's just too, you know, you run a business, you, you don't know. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so fundamentally, uh, it was that I, I felt no one else was doing it. Yes. And at the same time as no one was doing it, businesses were complaining about it all the time and yes. say, young people haven't got the skills. They haven't got the qualifications that yeah. are important to us. They've just got these paper things, which yeah. are useless. Um, you know, what we need to do is reskill them. And so everyone was saying it needed to be done. And nobody was doing it. And I just thought, well, hang on a sec. This is something that I thought was really important 15 years ago. Yeah. And it and it and it's taken a long time. Surely now there's enough um, general groundswell of opinion that this is, will be useful. And the one thing I changed was I was trying to fight forces. There's a great quote from Buckminster Fuller who says, Don't fight forces, use them. I was trying to say, No, you're wrong, don't do that, do this. Yeah. And everyone was going, you know what it's like when people say, there you're wrong, yeah, yeah, the shutters come down, that's it. So I realized, okay, what we'll do is we'll do alongside the academic side yeah. of things, we'll run the real businesses so that individuals could still get their A-levels if they wanted that, yes. right? Or at the moment we're doing um, also an option to do the Ontario High School Diploma, which is more of a, a, a vocational thing. But you can still do the A-levels, but... And that satisfies the parents, yes. right, that these things are happening. But as a result of freeing up, well, as a result of doing some quite interesting accelerated learning methods, mm. we have more time in the curriculum. And we have, we have kids coming through. If they're smart, they can do their entire A-level syllabus in like a month. <laughs> if they're smart and they're well motivated, yeah. if you've got really advanced techniques, right? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, I mean, these days there's no excuse for not becoming... If you if you've got self discipline and an internet connection, yes. you can master anything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, so, right. Entire so, universities having all the lectures for free on, yeah, online. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So I suppose that's a long answer to the fact that um, I just felt that it's something that everyone was saying was important, but no one seemed to be doing anything about. So I just thought, well, maybe what we'll do is. Do uh, it. Maybe, well, maybe we'll we'll just try it and see what happens. Yeah. Uh, you know, as you were saying earlier, on, just try stuff. You'll make lots of mistakes. We've made lots of mistakes already. Yeah. But the, the the point is, what we're trying to do is at least close the gap. Yeah. Between what industry wants and education does. Yeah. Because at the moment, it's just not yeah, not yeah, working, yeah, is it? Yeah, yeah. And 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 in this country, it's a lot better than where I'm from because in Italy. Literally, you graduate from any university and then you're floating around. You know, you're hoping that somebody will give you a job because because it's so disconnected. Yeah. You know, even degrees, very technical yeah. degrees like uh, computer science degree, engineering degrees, you know, it wouldn't take much for a university to say, okay, what is the latest that mechanical engineers need? 
from an industry. You can yeah. go, there are lots of industry out there. You can go out there and learn yeah. and bring back this knowledge into the, into the, 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 the curriculum. Yeah. What, what the problem is, all the people that are teaching now will be out of job, or, right. or many of them, because, because they are not up to date to what the, the, well, the industry needs. Completely. What I always liked saying to people when they were saying, well, is there a need for this? I said, well, let's just look at the, the end of the uh, pipe at the moment. Yeah. What's happening is people are coming out of 20 years of education. Yeah. They're going to age four or five. They come out sort of with a PhD or something. Or even if the degree, you know, 18, 20 years, 21, 22, 23, 24. If I'm a business owner yeah. or you're a business owner, what would you pay those people to actually do? Nothing. They can't do anything. Awesome. So if I'm not going to spend, why would I spend my money on employing someone who's got that? I would have to train them more or less from scratch in the important things. So, so you've got to ask yourself as an economy, why are we spending 20 years of taxes or tax money really yeah. going to train people who we as employers wouldn't really think are valuable at all yeah and it's just like oh that's interesting isn't it yeah so so anyway so um <laughs> that's great it's great oh, great yeah so you mentioned a few things it was that one particular thing that was kind of holding you back in in this process of starting this uh, new School. Yeah, I, 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 I think so. Like any any business person, it's, um, you know, when it comes to it, you've really got to put your own money into stuff to get it yeah. to work, right? And I just didn't have actually significant of my own money until sort of 2015 or so to actually put yeah. it in. And so I had to show that I was backing myself. You know what? And, um, you know, I, I, as a personal thing, you know, I, I made a decision which probably my wife didn't think was a good idea, right? You know, you know when you could have put money into... A new house. A new house, right. Yeah. Or, or whatever. And I thought, well, no, this is really important. Let's just get behind it. Yeah. Let's just go for it. And, you know, I'm, as a result of this, we're, 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 we're profitable, yeah. right? We're, and the most important thing is, is to get to profitable. So we're, we're profitable. We're small. We're profitable. We're proving it. We're getting some results. People are happy. Students are getting into good universities. Yeah. Like we've got a couple of students going out for interviews in Cambridge in the next few weeks. Wow. Right? Um, whether they'll get into Cambridge, I don't know. So it's not that we don't have academic kids, but we're also getting kids that are real self-starters. So they, they work on stuff. They do their own projects. So when they're talking to... Um, you know, universities, for, for, to, to get, it's like, oh my goodness, they're, they're getting much lower offers than they would get normally if they'd just done their A-levels because they're, 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 you know, they've got all this experience. Yeah. So it doesn't just have to be for people that want to be an entrepreneur right away, but the experience they get in entrepreneurial thinking, they can apply to whatever career they're going to do, whether they even want to become a medic. We've got one girl who's up at Newcastle University, wants to study medicine. And we said, well, why do you want to come to us? You know, there's lots of other places. Yeah, I want to, I want to think like an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, years ago, being an entrepreneur, you were kind of a strange figure nowadays. Yeah. There are entrepreneurs that are treated like rock stars. It's, it's, yeah. it's a fundamental shift in, in yeah. the thinking of people for entrepreneurship, which is something very interesting. I think it's good. What has been your biggest challenge, if you can describe one in particular, in in this path to you opening this school? Okay, so in this particular school, I think probably just, um, is, I would say it's no different from any, any other business. You know, just getting, um, getting revenues in quickly enough um so because you're burning you've got a burn rate we've all got it and make keeping your burn rate as low as possible so you can actually get revenues in to just start becoming yeah. profitable that's no different for every every challenge so that's the specific business thing on a personal level my challenge has always been to um stay focused on things long enough yes for the you know consistency consistency that's yeah. my because i've i've done lots of things and i'm very um i'm very Easily distracted. Yes. Right? And easily distracted by the next shiny new thing. Yes. Like, like many of us. Yes. And especially if you're kind of entrepreneurial, sometimes you're calling yourself entrepreneurial because you want to make your own decisions all the time. Yeah. And actually, some of the decisions that you need to make as a, as a business owner are the ones that you just got to stick at this. 
you just got to stick at this. You got to stay. Yeah. You got to plug away. Stay there. And you don't like that necessarily. No. If you're, you want to go, oh, oh, this is more this interesting. Is more this interesting. is more interesting. Yeah. 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 So that's yeah. a big challenge, I think. I, I'm, I don't think I'm un, unusual in that. No. The, the the same the same characteristics that attract you to a life of an entrepreneur also mean that you don't really want to do things you don't have to do. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. No. Absolutely. I agree entirely. And it's a very common thing that yeah, uh, yeah the next shiny things becomes more important because uh-huh. it's new. It's the novelty. It's like you know you you have a period of, of growth and then a period of stable stable. Yeah. And, you, you, yeah, and, and also staying staying at something for long enough to give it a chance is really important nothing nothing really great happens overnight the pyramids are around still but they didn't take you know no, they didn't they happen overnight exactly. Yes. And you know anything that happens too quickly as a result of maybe a lot of marketing a lot of VC money you could probably bet that it's going to need a lot of continuous sort of like support to keep going. Yeah. Whereas things that happen purely organically yes. as a result, even if they take longer, you know that they're not going to suddenly disappear because they are offering value. So, you know, it's it's a good thing that things take time in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. But it's as difficult. As I've got eight children, right? So it's difficult when you... Oh, yes, you yeah, mentioned. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, and you, you met the eldest one, Henry. Oh, so, so the, yeah. Henry is the oldest. He's the eldest, 22, all the way down to four. Um, married twice, yes. so four children with each it with is. each wife. Okay, wow. <laughs> which is a kind of a bit of a an interesting situation. But the point is, you know, at the same time as being patient, you've also at times got to know when this is the wrong thing to be doing. Sometimes the universe is is pointing in a different direction, and you're being just stubborn. Yeah. So you've got these two. One is oh, I've got to stick at it, and the other is oh, you know, maybe. There's always there's always uh, this dilemma. There's yeah. uh, people say if you quit too early, um, then you're never gonna get the, the, the results. Yeah. Okay. At the same time, sometimes you need also to have enough uh, clarity to say, okay, this is never gonna work, yeah. and step away from it. But it's a very subtle line. It's a very thin line between give up and you might give up just yeah. one minute too early yeah. that yeah. you would have become successful rather than rather than uh, you know stick to something that is never going to work you know and and this is probably one of the single most difficult things to to ascertain i think yeah. you know when to persist and when to realize that it's a sign that you need to do something else i mean how how do you when you're talking to people what 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 sort of mechanism do you give them for learning how to discern the, these differences i mean well, I think in general, my, the way I work is, you know, just asking the right questions and say, mm-hmm. so how do you see it's going to work? Yeah. You know, how, and sometimes it's, it, it screams at you that it's yeah. not going to work ever, but yeah. you don't want to say, oh, this is not going to work. You know, yeah. it's like telling the mom that your child right. is not very nice. Yeah, yeah? exactly. It's not good looking. Yeah. So you need to ask the question, say, do you really think, and you, you just, sometimes in my, uh, analytical kind of experience I just ask the question so how much money are you making at the moment you know you make a thousand pounds a week that's fine so how much are you spending well I'm spending 975 pounds a week okay so that means you're making yeah. effectively net 25 pounds a week is that sustainable how long can you go on that yeah how long can you go on and yeah. the point is people don't realize you know oh I'm making lots of money but you're also spending lots of money and sometimes they spend lots of money because they never thought how to optimize their cost but very often because they make money, but they still don't make the money that they should be making for yeah. the same transaction. Yeah. So reviewing the prices sometimes is enough. So this yeah. sort of thing. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's an important thing. But pride, I think, is a big one, especially yeah. if you've owned it. It's your baby. It's, it's like, baby. Of course. who wants to hear when your baby's ugly? Nobody, no, right? Nobody. Exactly. No, <laughs> That's the same thing. No. Your business isn't going to work. It's the same kind of thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> and, and this is where you need to set some parameters sometimes and say, okay, we, as long as we are between X and Y, we keep it. Yeah. If it's... Uh, even if it's X and Y and you are out by 0.5%, you might be flexible enough. But if you are out by 50%, then there is something wrong and you need to do act in one way or the other. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Right, so you say you've been an entrepreneur for a long time now. Mm. Uh, So Mm. you've, you've done this teaching before. Um, and so on. So can you list a few milestones from starting out like a few step 
points where you see the, the change of direction. So you, you were a teacher in mm. the UK, then you, mm. you mentioned you were a teacher in Hong Kong, but you, you went there probably teaching physics and then you became yeah. a teacher of entrepreneurship. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I suppose when I was younger, I always played in bands. Played, wrote songs, put a band together. Yeah. I always had a vision for myself which was, wasn't straightforward. Rock you know. Star, rock well, star. it was like influence. Yeah. And it, yeah, I thought it was through music. Yes. So I love performing. I love being, you know, live in front of teaching. Yes. Is, teaching sort of satisfies that a little bit because you're promoting things and you're talking, you're selling ideas yeah, yeah. and that sort of stuff a little bit. But I always knew that I wanted to do something non I would say I'm a contrarian. No. If everyone's going one way, first thing I'll do is I'll look at the opposite. Quite often that leads to nothing, mm -hmm. but sometimes that leads to something quite interesting. So I'm always going to look at doing things differently. So I didn't go to university straight away. At age 18, I went out on holiday to Spain, fiesta, met a Spanish girl. I thought, oh, she's nice. I'm going to take a year off and do something different. Oh, wow. And, you know, in that year off, I, I, I thought, well, I'd, I'd come back to the UK, do try to get into Oxford, because that's quite a good, you know, got into Oxford, yeah, and went back and taught English um, and, and did things. So I was thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do things very different, but I wasn't sure um, whether it's business or music or politics or any of these things until I realised, I suppose, that control over my time was the most important yeah. thing. And so going into teaching was really just, it, 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 it was never going to be something that I was going to do long term. It's just how can I find out? So I taught in the private sector. I taught in the state sector. I taught in the UK and taught internationally. By the time I've got that feel, I, I sort of understand education. Now. <laughs> Definitely. I'm right. Sure. Okay. <laughs> so then I thought, okay, you know, how can I then turn this into yeah. control? And it was as in Hong Kong when you only... Hong Kong's a wonderful place for attracting people who are a little bit different and think yeah. differently. The English people or the Australians that go there, they're already open to going and living in a different country. Yeah. So they're all much more entrepreneurial, much more pioneering. Yeah. And then the Chinese there that are interacting with you are kind of looking to leverage the fact that you're British or whatever yeah. to like set stuff up. So the first school I set up was an English school there and that was just in a partnership with a local Chinese guy. Yeah. And then I got the taste of, you know, Control. I, sp I, think, I think that's probably it. I thought taste of control. And what I don't like in life is I don't like... Do you remember being at school, right? I don't know what happens in Italy. Yeah. And you kind of... It's a... Maybe it's a sporting event or maybe it's a playtime or something. And you've got a whole bunch of kids along a wall waiting to get picked. And you've got your captains... And you've got, you know, they're taking turns to pick yeah. a football team. I don't know. I remember that. I, I, I was always the last to be picking well, sports in thing. ball sports because I was off. This is the thing. I didn't ever want that experience of waiting to be picked. No, exactly. I didn't like So for me, depending on other people for stuff, waiting to be picked was kind of the worst yeah. feeling. And it, I was quite lucky. I was quite sporty. So most of the time I was, you know, either picked early on or a captain. But just that feeling of sort of, asking permission for yeah. stuff and having to ask a boss if you could have a day off or something like that I just you know what kind of I, I, we're supposed to be the most advanced species on the planet in a way right you know and then, then we've got some people that can't do stuff in their life that's really important to them because their boss won't give them the time off that's nonsense yeah to me. no 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 I, I, I agree this is one of the reasons I became an entrepreneur myself and I totally enjoyed that aspect yeah. more than anything else yeah, yeah absolutely and, and it gives a lot of other problems oh, of but course. at least you know that you know you don't have to ask permission for things so I think that was the crystallizing moment when I realized this was a way in which I could ask uh, wouldn't have to ask permission and also means you can't blame anybody. <laughs> no, 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 exactly. exactly. We, exactly. We're here as, as a result of all the decisions we've made and most of them have been, you know, not optimal. Most I've certainly made more bad decisions than good decisions, for yeah. sure. But, you yeah, know, we're going in the right direction. Yeah, but, yeah as you say, you, you keep improving, you try to reduce the entity of the mistakes or the frequency of mistakes at least otherwise obviously you wouldn't be where you yeah. are if you made too many bad mistakes you would be out of business anyway yeah, yeah exactly and um, given your 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 professional given your yeah. business at the moment this question is nearly superfluous but do you think more people should become entrepreneurs definitely and i don't think should become are going to need to become right is the, i think and part of the reason i think our school is um 
doing something very interesting is because we're painting a picture where other people can also take responsibility for their own lives as well. Yeah. And look, let's be honest. I mean, if you can at least take control over your means of existing, yes. you know, and if you think of yourself as a business, even if you're an employee, you are selling your time for money. So you have an exchange with people yeah. which involves in you doing stuff and you getting paid for it in return. If So if you extend that and think of yourself as a business and you can take responsibility, we're thinking of it like teaching young people to... Um, to become architects of their own lives. Yeah. Really. So I think it's going to be required for more people to take responsibility for being architects of their own lives. And what we're doing is, I suppose, teaching them, you know, you don't have to make all the mistakes yourself. No. You know, why are you doing this podcast? Hopefully, because people will learn some stuff. Yeah. There's so much great stuff out there. Yeah. The difficulty is that um, it's quite difficult quite difficult to pass it for all the good stuff and bad stuff and yeah. curate it and know who you should listen to and who not yeah. to listen to because there's so much great stuff out there but there's a lot of guff as well and you could just waste a week just looking for an expert on how to do a podcast couldn't you right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> right. absolutely. Absolutely. so so yeah i think it's going to be a requirement and i think that's why i'm really excited about the future because i think more more and more people taking responsibility for their radical uniqueness mm. Creates a better world, right? Yeah. Because if you have a job and you don't like your job, I have to live in the world that you are in where you're not quite satisfied. Yeah. And your wife isn't quite satisfied and your children aren't quite satisfied because you're not as great as you could be. Yeah. Now, if you're doing something that you really, really love, I get to benefit from that yeah. because I get to be in the world with someone who's doing something that they really love. I think so, it's perfect definition. I really yeah. like it. Thank you. Really, really good. Okay, is there one person who had most influence in your life? Um, there's a few people, actually. I mean, everyone says there's a... A lot of people talk point to like a, a strong sort of family kind of figure. I mean, mm. my dad just... He said, look, I don't care what you've got as long as... Well, he said to, to his wife, my mum, yeah. I don't care how they do as long as they they're confident about yeah. stuff i just want them to be confident because if they're confident about things then they'll try and if they try they'll learn yeah, and yeah if yeah. they learn then they'll improve so it, it starts with confidence if you don't have confidence then you won't try and then that whole arc doesn't go anywhere so for his principles and the fact that he was just i mean he, he died quite young actually 70 when he died mm. um prostate cancer and we're catholic Grew up Catholic tradition, yeah. and so you know the the church is full. I'm looking around, you know, I'm saying, and then when it got to communion, right, it just went on and on and on. I was going, well, how on earth? What's going on? I just, it's sort of you, you 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 let it slip. You don't worry about it. And then when we're carrying the coffin out at the end, we see the car park is full. Oh. There's hundreds of people in the car park that couldn't even fit into the church. Oh. That's why they all come out to pay respects. Now, I know because he was seven, 70s, quite young, so a lot of his contemporaries might have still been alive. So that's a factor, yeah. sure. sure. And he's got a big family, so that's a factor. But that guy had so much influence over so many people, and they all wanted to come to his funeral. Now, that is really inspiring to think that so many people, you know, that they couldn't even fit into the church came to your funeral. Wow. So he was a good man. And... I liked his general approach, which was like, you know, to do lots of things and to be an entrepreneur and to try stuff and all that. So it's good. But probably in, um, I've got a mentor oh. and since about mid 2000s, um, this guy called Richard Wilkins. And I think it's really important to have a mentor yeah. and somebody that you can, um, you know, that someone who is in a position in life that not you would like to be, because I don't want to give the impression that I'm unsatisfied no. or whatever, but I think, you know, I don't want to take advice from people who haven't got what I've got. Yeah. And he's got this wonderful way of looking at the world and got a real sense of balance in his life mm. and he's got tremendous wisdom. So I really, really enjoy spending time with that component. So, yeah, yeah he's he's been really influential. Based on, you know, he's a sort of guy who does really simple things. So sometimes he'll, he'll wear two ties because he can't work out which, you know, just, you know, he's, oh, I couldn't work out. So I just thought I'd wear two, you know, just like, you know, it's just little <laughs> things that like it looks at the world quite differently and it always encourages me to, to see things differently. So I'd say those two people, tremendously, yeah. Right. Sure. Yeah. 
Do you remember one mistake that was more painful than the others? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, do I remember one mistake? Yeah, yeah, I do remember one one mistake um, that was particularly painful, which was we had a lot of people in Hong Kong interested in the business school mm -hmm. and the business school methodology that we're yeah. doing. We had quite a few investors who were interested in putting money in and me and my, this is one of my cousins who, who started the business in Hong Kong together, um, we were probably a bit up our own asses and thought it was more valuable than it was. Mm -hmm. And we ended up being in a position where we didn't give a share of the business to someone who's coming with a good slug of money mm -hmm. because we thought that... We'd keep it for ourselves. Yeah, it's be more we thought we did. And, and ended up then... And then what happened is then the personal family situation changed and things happened and you know so that was I think that was hubris thinking that we were more powerful or more yeah. impressive and I think that was that was a bit of a mistake but you know what I'm I'm still making mistakes you yeah. know? Or, we all are and, and you know I think probably the biggest type of mistake I make now is is expecting people to be able to do the things that they hope they can do you know, because of their optimism. Yeah. And maybe trusting people's optimism has led to... So that, that's been a part... When I've... I think if I look back at the types of things, one of my character defects, if you like, is that I'm probably not as rigorous at trusting people or making sure that people are really going to be realistic about the things that they say they're going to yeah. be able to do when it comes to recruiting students or generating capital or raising money or whatever. I think that sometimes I'm just, well, they've got 20 years experience of X, Y, and Z, so I'm going to trust them. Whereas sometimes, yeah, I think so. Yes. Okay. Is there anything you would change in your past, which normally this may interpretation of this question is mm. either regret things you didn't do or things mistakes you like done, the mistake yeah, you just yeah, mentioned yeah, yeah. seems like something <laughs> well yeah def definitely you, you can look at all these things but i suppose my perspective is is that um, especially if someone who's been divorced right and you mm. know that, that there's family issues yeah. and things like that you say well okay if i hadn't done this and i hadn't done that but actually then he said, well, if I hadn't done this, mm. then I wouldn't have been in a position where I met Cindy and yeah. had many kids. So one of the things I am I choose to do, and it's not the truth, it's yeah. just what I choose to do, is I choose to see that everything's happened, not because it was predestined, not yeah. for a reason, no. but everything's happened, and you know what, it is what it is, and I can, I can, I can see that I could have only got here this way yeah so i could have only been in a situation where i'm happy i'm fit i'm healthy i've got eight children i'm based in cambridge i've got these things as a result as a result of all these things and if any of them change then it would be slightly different so i don't of course doesn't mean i'm not open to looking at doing things differently yeah, yeah, yeah. but i'm just thinking well you know what if like for example here's a classic one my wife recently, and she's recovered. She's the, out the other side of breast cancer, which is great. Oh. Okay, this is fantastic. But she's really good at this as well because she went to the doctors five years ago saying that she f thought she had something in, in one of her breasts. And they checked it and they did an analysis and they said, oh, it's, it's just a cyst. We find out, okay. Hmm. Right. And then th three years later, we found out that, well... We don't know, because of course you don't know the exactly the same thing, but we found out that there was cancer there. Mm. And then you think, oh, okay. And so the, the, the annoying thing is, well, hang on a sec, you know, three years earlier she'd been for a checkup and had it checked out and said, you know. But, and this is the thing, if she, they had found out that it was cancer at the time, yeah. maybe they would have been able to operate it and, you know, maybe wouldn't have had to then have chemo because they yeah. have got it early and all those sure. things. But the chances are they possibly would have had to do things, might have looked at a few other things, might have given her some chemo anyway, and she might not have been able to get pregnant with our fourth child, mm. who was born four years ago, oh. right? So if the cancer had been picked up then, it might have meant that the fourth child wasn't born. Right. So 
I'm very optimistic about all the things I say, well, that's not really, that, that wasn't really a disaster because that yeah. led to that, or, you know, Theo was born and other things. Plus, it's a choice, I think, to look back at things and think, well, you know, let's look at always, you know, what, what, what the wonderful, I mean, I'm in Cambridge as a result of not being able to see my eldest child for quite a number of years in the first marriage when that sort of ended up. Couldn't see him for a long time. All right. He left home went to Cambridge University. Yes. And because I hadn't seen him for quite a long time, you moved to Cambridge. I moved to Cambridge. Wow. Right? <laughs> so so here I am now. Now, this is another thing. I didn't get to see my kids for quite a long time. It was quite acrimonious, the first marriage, mm. right? Quite a long time, there was a period where I couldn't get to see them going backwards and forwards with court and all those things. You know, really tough stuff. No, you know, not be able to see your own children I against can't your exactly. I don't want to imagine yeah. for, for a family person. That's 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 really really difficult. Yeah. But what's interesting now is, and you met Henry now, yes. because I didn't have any period of significant contact with him for that sort of teenage and young man period. Yeah. When I saw him and started seeing him again at age 18, he'd got over the difficult sort of things, yeah. teenager thing. So now we're just like really good mates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I don't Great. I don't ever have to go through that feeling of, oh, I wish I was closer to my yeah. son because we had all this argy-bargy in yeah. the teenage period. Yeah. So now it's like, well, I'd never have chosen it, but the benefit of that is that, and his, the next brother down who's at Warwick University, yeah. um, you know, we were up there last week for his 21st and just, just, a bunch of guys just chatting over a beer and some food Fantastic. and you know just a wonderful sort of adult relationship and you know what there's a lot many years later on when you're going to be with your children as adults yes. than when you're responsible for them and they're growing up and even though it seems terrible at the time if I'd known then that I was going to have a decent relationship with them later on yeah you know, I'd have taken that rather than having a you know seeing them a lot now and then maybe falling out with them or whatever yeah no no so no. Absolutely. Yeah. So, but yeah, but it's. I wouldn't wish it upon anyone, but no, you know. But we are where we are as a result of everything that happened in the past. You know? Great. Yeah. Okay. So, talking about some routines in your yeah. in your business. So, do you have a daily or weekly routine related to your to your way, the way you run your school? Um, not really. Well, I mean. It's an interesting one because of course school has a timetable. Yeah, right. Of so so yeah, it has that kind of that regular thing. But we have um we work in in or we try as as much as possible to work in sort of units like sprints. Hmm. So short sprints. So we'll have a very clear um things that you're expected to do in a month, things you expect to do in a week, and things you expect to do in a day. I will give this to to the listeners. Probably the best sort of personal productivity system that I've found. Now, I'm yeah. a big fan of David Allen and getting things done. Really like those sorts of things. Really good. But the one that we use in the school, and I use personally, it's called Agile Results. Yes. And it's by a guy um, called J.D. Meyer, who's a Microsoft program manager, quite high up in Microsoft. Oh. And it's a brilliant system. And it's so simple, you don't need any technology, but you can use technology. Yeah. Um, and you just say... What three outcomes do I want for today? Right. What yes, three wins that. do I want for the day? And then so, and then you build your day, and then so you go forward to the end of the day. If if it was the end of the day, what what three things would I feel good having achieved? It's not a list of things to do. It's just outcomes to have. Yeah. And so we teach kids every single day to, and we do it ourselves every single day. What three wins do you want for the day? And those three daily wins go to support the weekly wins. Yeah. So on a Monday, so this would be the cycle. Monday morning, what are the three weekly wins you want? So by Friday, these wins that you've got to achieve. Now, how do you know what to write down for the week? Well, you look at your month and you say, what are the three wins I want for the month? You know, it's really, really simple. But it avoids you making long laundry lists of things to do and stuff like that and then moving forward. And also, what's great about it is you you get to decide... Things naturally, if they're not that important because it's an outcome, you know, you don't have to worry about it too much. And so on a Friday, we have a review. Mm -hmm. So Friday afternoon, I do a weekly review and it's just, um, okay, so what three things that are going well or went well, three things that we can learn from and improve. And that cycle, that cadence, I mean, I think the week's a wonderful thing. Here's something interesting, right? Mm. The week... Is the only time period in regular human use that isn't determined by the 
by the elements or the seasons or the, yeah. the world, right? The year is because of the world yeah. around the sun. The day. The day is the earth spinning around on itself. The month is based on the moon cycle, yes. right? The week is something we made up. We made up, but it's persisted now. So it has to be something that's beneficial. There has to be something about that regular cadence of the week that works. Yes. And that's why I find it's really, it's a really good unit. So Monday morning, plan the three wins for the week. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, what three wins for the day are we looking to do to support the wins for the week? And then Friday, hmm, how we'll did we reflect? So brilliant. Yeah, okay. fantastic. Do you have any particular... I'm talking personally in this case, yeah. morning routine. Do you do something in particular regularly? Well, interestingly, yeah. Two things we do as um, as a couple, me and my wife. Um, the first of which is we get up and we do yoga together. Right. And have a cup of coffee together before. You know, with, with young children, yes. we always used to try and have evening time. Mm. What's the problem with the evening when you've got young children? Everybody's tired. Everybody's exhausted. The most you can do in the evening, at the end of the day, when you've spent all your energy, is veg Relax. out, have a glass of wine, watch some TV. Yeah. So we found that we weren't getting any personal Time. connection time so we came up with a system which is we don't get up too early I mean our school starts at 10 because it deals with teenagers so mm. you know, there's no point starting at 8 yeah. you know? yeah. so we get up and we do so only 10-15 minutes of yoga to have a cup of, together have a cup of coffee together and just no phones yeah no no uh, devices no interruptions you know and you, it's brilliant. And we supplement that with Saturday complete digital detox. Great. That's probably been the single thing that I would say for the relationship is, has made more, had more beneficial impact in the 10 years of being married. Just deciding to spend a whole day once a week that's totally different from every other day. Yes. So we don't, we don't have phones, we don't have iPads, we don't have anything. And first few weeks you're doing it, you're going, <sighs> oh, yeah. You know what the biggest one is? Terrible, really embarrassing to admit it. I'm sure it's everybody. What do you do when you go to the toilet? <laughs> you go to the toilet and you go, oh, because oh. we bring don't read the book. paper anymore. You know, bring a book. Like, yeah, exactly. Bring a, bring exactly. a magazine, yeah. No, like, but um, in the good old days. Yeah. So I would say the routine, the daily routine, having time with people when you've got something to offer, yeah. when you're feeling fresh, is brilliant. And then every one day a week, where you, if you can. I speak to some people and they say, oh, I just couldn't do that because I'm so busy at weekends and I'm, I'm so important. People send me emails. That was what I said to my wife initially. And she said, if it's if if you're that important, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. And uh, the point is, uh, you know, if um, you know, I have people sending me emails at 9.40 in the, mo- in the evening and then they call me at you know, 8 o'clock, 8.30 the following morning and say, um, Massimo, you know, I sent you the email last night. I said, last night, what time did you send it? 9.40. And do you think I'm reading emails at 9.40 in the evening? I'm sorry. <laughs> so I started to put an autoresponder. I check emails, 9 to Friday, 9 oh, I've to seen five, that from you, actually, yeah. 9 till 5, Monday yeah. to Friday. Yeah. It's just to avoid people yeah. having false expectations. Yeah. Don't, I'm sorry, you know, for me, email is always something I had at work. Yeah. And yes, I use email personally, but I just set it yeah. as a yeah. thing yeah. I check at work in front of a computer. Yeah. I don't have emails on my phone. Yeah. I do not read them. I can, but I disable the update. So if I'm looking for an email, you I can check it, it on my ah, phone anytime, yeah. but I don't have push notification. Otherwise, the phone keeps pushing beep, 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 I think, all the time. Look, I think that's a real skill, and I'm not sure that young people are prepared for this. <laughs> I'm not sure that anybody is really taught systematic way yeah. of making sure you can get properly into the zone and do deep work. Yes. So a lot of people do shallow work and they'll check email and the phone goes and they, they find like the four hours and they do nothing. No, no. Absolutely. Right? I think it's an advantage if you're a writer or you're having to create stuff because yeah. I know that I need to go into uh, I need to go into the zone to, yeah. to actually create stuff. Sure. Um, Absolutely. So I need to switch on. Oh, one other thing on to routines. Yes. The Italian um, routine the Francisco Cirillo and the Pomodoro. Oh, yeah, Pomodoro yeah. technique. Yeah, yeah we, do, we do that all the time, religiously, yeah. religiously. Do it for meetings, and we say, okay, let's have a quick pom on this. So yeah. just use it. And it's brilliant because it focuses you. Quite often you have a meeting and it kind of goes... Uh, it drives you know, on. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. So we do that. We do that for a 25 on, 
five minutes off. Yeah. Um, and I do that personally, especially when I'm working on long projects. And mm. I know I've got to complete a marketing plan or something in three days. I know that if I don't do it in POMs, as yeah. we call them, by the time I've been going three or four hours, I'll be exhausted. Absolutely. You mentioned the yoga with the wife. Yeah. Um, do you do any other kind of ex- regular exercise? Not as much uh, as I as I should do. I used to play a lot of football. All right, football, to, soccer. A lot of fo- soccer. Yeah, I used to proper, play that a proper, lot. Proper, proper. 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 Until, well, I say until probably early forties, you know, yeah. late late thirties. Haven't quite replaced the cardio with anything yet. Mm. So at the moment, all I do other than the yoga is I do just body, and then did an exercise. A, I call it a plank up. Mm. And it's just a plank, but in the weakest range of movement for the press up. Yeah. So you're just trying to, I say invent it, I'm sure loads of people do it. But the idea is that you're working in the the hardest part of the press up, but sort of just keeping all your body in a plank. Yeah. And if I, I try and do, you know, just 30 or 40 of those every day. Oh. But you know what? It's, um, that's on my... You know what it's like, as you sort of like, you said this, we were talking earlier, and you said you started at 16 and you never considered not doing the martial arts. Yeah. Because the things that I've done is, have always been around a team sport that's required events and playing. Yes. I haven't transitioned effectively into something which I'm going to want to continue to do. I've never got into running and jogging, not mm. interested in that sort of stuff. So I haven't quite worked that out. So maybe um, I need to take a look at that. Yeah, because he said there's no point being being happy yeah. and being quite successful and having control over your life if you can have you know have Absolutely. a heart attack. <laughs> yeah. Right, where do you see yourself as an entrepreneur in three years' time? Okay, um, my long longer term goal is to be traveling around the world with my wife and right. the children be a little bit older and have a series of international schools or establishments all over the world and I'm just literally going there and doing talks and presenting and you know inspiring them I love that sort of stuff I worked yeah, yeah I worked in that's, career development for a while and I was what's really interesting you know if you're a prophet's never a prophet in the hometown in the home country right mm. so because my wife's from Texas oh, I became nice. quite popular in Austin and I would go over and do lots of talks over there because I'm the British guy okay. um, and that sort of thing going over and doing talks and explaining you know techniques for accelerated learning techniques for entrepreneurship techniques for productivity um, I think would be really I'd love to do and the, the reason why I'm attracted to international schools is partly because that supports that. Yes. You know, yes. so if I have to travel, then I can yeah. coach and train people. I mean, I do some training in Nigeria. I've got a bunch of teachers there, and I've been to Nigeria five or six times in the last year. And that's pretty much pro bono. I just cover the cost sure. of, of flying over. And I love just being in a room and just giving people some ideas that might be quite useful. Fantastic. I guess it plays the rock star sort of vanity yeah. type thing. You yeah. like that yeah. kind of, yeah. 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 So that was, and so, so really over the next three years, it's been a position where we've got, and probably at least two international schools have opened within three years. Because we're yeah. opening our first September 2019, and the second one is planned for September 2020. Fantastic. Um, if we have two open then, um, you know, who knows, who knows where it could lead. Yeah, you know, amazing. Yeah. Really, really nice. Do you remember your proudest moment to date of your entrepreneurship activity? Crikey, Moses. Um, proudest moment. I, I think um, there, was a, there was a period where I was the number one in Google for mind mastery. Oh, wow. Which was for about, for about three or four years, um, from 2013 or 2014 to about 2016 or so. I haven't really continued... You know, basically, I I I did a a course on Udemy called Everyday Mind Mastery, right? And there was I was just lucky. I was just early adopter. I I went on online pr- platforms yeah. and went on about ten of them. And when you say lucky, I just Udemy was one of the ones that really took yeah. off, right? And so there's one period because I was an early adopter. There's one screenshot I've got where it's like it's Udemy's top ten courses, and there's Mark, Mark Zuckerberg is doing one something on Facebook. 
Yes. And then Marissa Meyer, who yes. was, was at Yahoo, but she now was, she's a she, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. She was at Google at the time, and she had. A, and then I was like, I was num- number five, and like he he was wow. number six, and she was number seven. So, I mean, it was just. And the, and the thing is, you get the snowball effect. So I'd get several hundred people joining my courses every day. Wow. And the course was called Everyday Mind Mastery. And because of Google's SEO, Google likes web pages that have the actual yeah, title in. Of so, of course, every time someone signed up, they create a web page, yeah. you know, which has Everyday Mind Mastery, Tom Cassidy. So basically, whenever you Googled Mind Mastery, wow. I'd come up with number one. Um, and then uh, what happened, though, probably... My mistake, in a way, was to move to monetize it too early. Mm. So I had about seventy or eighty thousand people on this course, and I thought wow. probably time I started monetizing because this is a free one. And then what happens is people just don't sign up as much. Yes, yes. So it's, it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? So, yeah, yeah, no, so absolutely. I think I read somewhere that the 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 businesses that are going to survive or be the most successful in the future, the ones that have designed their business model so they can give the best high quality free stuff away for the longest yes. time. You know, if people really appreciate something, uh, a service, and you can find a way of giving it away for free, like LinkedIn, like yeah. Facebook, like yeah. YouTube, like Google, like all these things, and yeah. it kind of makes sense. Yeah. Although, yeah, it, for true. them, very often it makes sense. Uh, I just finished reading from zero to one from... Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, feel. Yeah, I've got that. And uh, you know, the fact is, many of these businesses made it because they could keep doing it for many years because yeah. they had billions in investment PC. or ma- many millions okay. in investment. Yeah, exactly. For the for the average individual like us, it yeah. becomes a bit more complicated sometimes. <laughs> That's right, and you've got you got and you don't you never know when is the time to that you're going to start. As as my wife says, yeah. um, you know, give me something I can eat. <laughs> you know, can't eat promises. Can't eat no. Subscribers, no, you know, sh- <laughs> yeah, we are to the end nearly. Great. Um, if you could give someone starting out some advice as an entrepreneur, what mm. would it be? Or one, one piece of advice, let's say, um, it would probably be to, to find something that you felt wasn't right or didn't seem like it was working mm. and it made you either unhappy or you just, you know, you, the things that you liked that weren't quite right, just ask lots and lots of questions about that. Go deep into it and yeah. work out why that isn't right or why it isn't working, whether it's a political issue, whether it's an environmental issue, whether it's just a efficiency issue. Yeah. And... Um, don't don't believe that adequate solutions already exist um, out right. there because obviously they don't and persist with the fact that you could become an expert in this particular thing because you're interested in it. and just carry on carry on carry on thinking about it working out what what might what might be a possible solution yeah. and then kind of don't see yourself as someone who can't come up with something that's really good you know and then just try stuff you know most of the time your initial thoughts on it will be rubbish it will be terrible yeah. most of the things that you try as solutions won't be very good but if you commit if you feel that you've got the willingness and the um, the wherewithal to just go about it the wisdom will come yeah yeah I think and you learn from your mistakes yeah, yeah exactly so. exactly so uh, and, and probably on a personal don't take yourself too seriously <laughs> take yes. Take life seriously because, you know, it's it's a it's a wonderful gift. Yes, but don't absolutely. take don't take yourself too seriously. You know, be prepared to make fun of yourself and you know have a bit of a relax and you know, don't beat yourself up when you when you get stuff wrong. As you, you were saying earlier on, you know, you've got to be prepared to be your sort of your number one cheerleader yeah. as a, as an entrepreneur. It's very important. Really, yeah. yeah, exactly. That's Excellent. Right. Okay. Well, Tom, thank That's you very right. much for your for your time, your generous time, your generous answers. I think yeah. we can finish here. And thanks uh, for having looking me. Looking forward to see it published. Certainly, and um, let me know when you get to the next round. I'd definitely love to come back. Yes, thank All you right. very much. You're definitely invited. <laughs>